thanks so much for coming today on this beautiful day to Blank Park Zoo. Um, we're excited to have a pollinator lunch and learn today hosted by the zoo and the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And this is in celebration of the Iowa Soil and Water Conservation Week. My name is Jesse Lowry and I'm the Conservation Manager here at Blank Park Zoo. First, I'm going to say a few words about our pollinator project, Plant Grow Fly. And then we'll hear from our state apiarist, Andrew Joseph. And lastly, the, the 2015 American Honey Queen, Gabrielle Hemseth. And we hope that you leave today, um, have learned something new, and feel inspired to help uh, protect our native pollinators, butterflies, and bees. Um, so we'll go ahead and take questions after each speaker if there's time. If there's not time, we'll hold some of the questions till the end. Um, I want to take a few minutes to talk about our pollinator project, Plant Grow Fly, and how it fits into the broader scheme of Blank Park Zoo conservation. I've been here at Blank Park Zoo for 10 years. Over the years, we've supported over 50 wildlife conservation um, campaigns, mostly for animals like the lion, the giraffe, and the rhino. In the zoo world, we call these the charismatic megafauna. That is a term that we, that we use a lot in the zoo world. It's the fuzzy animals, the mammals, the adorable big animals that everybody gets excited about, the animals that you think of when you think of a zoo. But when it comes to conservation and conservation projects here at Blank Park Zoo, it's actually the charismatic microfauna that have blown us away as far as the reaction that we're getting from the community. I've never seen a reaction from the community um, like I am with this project. There's just something about butterflies, whether it's a nostalgic feeling about seeing butterflies in your childhood. I've heard hundreds of stories of people talking about how many monarchs they used to see in their backyard, or the first time they saw a butterfly emerge in the classroom. We're happy to be part of something that means so much to so many. Um, as conservation manager, I'm working to fulfill our zoo's mission to inspire an appreciation of the natural world through conservation, recreation, and education. And we're working to increase our zoo's support of the charismatic megafauna of the rhinos and giraffe and chimpanzees, but we're also working to become leaders in local conservation as well, the conservation of prey chickens, butterflies, and bees. A modern zoo is what I like to call a window to the wild. We want to provide an educational and recreational space for you to bring your family, for classrooms to come, look into the eyes of species big and small, see the majestic lion and lioness on the rock, and feel that awe that you feel when you see these beautiful animals. But then how do we turn that feeling of awe into conservation action? That's actually quite a, quite a leap sometimes. And so as conservation manager, that is my goal. In an effort to inspire true conservation action, we've developed our new pollinator project, Plant Grow Fly. So I'd like to start out by please asking you to raise your hand if you like coffee if you're wearing something made out of cotton, if you love chocolate. So by the end of that survey, everybody in the room has their hands raised. People do not realize how much we rely on pollinators in our everyday lives, but it goes much beyond coffee and chocolate. The mission of Plant Grow Fly is to encourage citizens and organizations to become aware of pollinator issues and to take action to preserve them. Why do we need pollinators? Well, it boils down to one third of our global food supply depends on the services they provide. One out of every three bites of food. And if you're a meat eater, another one third of your food supply is indirectly relies on pollinators. For example, if you eat beef, cows eat alfalfa, alfalfa is pollinated by insects. 75% of flowering plants on the face of the earth require animal pollinators. And as a conservation manager at a zoo, I like to point out that it's not just all about the humans. We may not eat all of the foods that they pollinate, but that's food for the rest of the animal kingdom. From grizzly bears to songbirds, pollinators are a vital, vital part of our ecosystem. Without them, many items that we eat every day would simply be off the menu. So very quickly, what are some of the reasons for pollinator decline? Global climate change, loss of habitat and feeding resources, and some modern agricultural practices. Butterflies, for example, require large swaths of suitable habitat to navigate between nectar sources. So our ever-expanding network of roads and towns and cities and farm fields have really presented them with a formidable challenge. Basically, in Iowa, we've gone from a state that looked like this to a state that looks like this. But of course, we need our towns and our cities and our farm fields. So how do we find a common ground 
and give these important insects the resources that they need. Well, what do they need to survive? They need places to lay their eggs, and they need stuff to eat. The foundation of Plant Grow Fly is to encourage everyday citizens to provide these habitat sources via butterfly gardens in their yard, at their school, or place of business. And we believe that by educating the public, we really can make a true impact on uh, pollinator conservation. And it's not just fluff. The experts in pollinator conservation, the Xerces Society, agrees that even small backyard gardens can help um, support pollinator populations. We believe that whether it's a single pot on your back porch or an entire prairie field, everybody can do their part. Our region-specific garden recipe, which is highlighted um, in some of the brochures on your table, and there's more brochures out in the hallway for everybody to have one, um, highlights the flowers and grasses that our local species need the most. Now, if you live outside the upper Midwest, of course, this list of plants is going to be slightly different, but you can still be part of Plant Grow Fly. You can go on our website, click a little box that says you live outside the upper Midwest, and we'll take you to other region-specific garden recipes for the entire um, US. And each of these plants were picked because they're prolific nectar producers, because they're important host plants for butterflies, because they're native to the area, because they can be easily found at your local greenhouses, because they'll thrive in a backyard garden, all of these characteristics coming together to make sure that novice gardeners are successful and butterflies can find the food that they need. So here's the cool part. After you plant your garden, you can register it with Blank Park Zoo. We'll recognize you on our website. You get to name your garden. Some of our favorite names are Bonsai Betty's Butterfly Bar and Garden of Whedon. It's a really fun activity with your family uh, to get together and come up with these creative names. You can tell us what inspired you, because we know that this project isn't just good for the pollinators, but it's good for the human animal as well. It's great for the kids to get out from in front of the TV and the video games and get out back and get dirty and plant the seeds. Um, we'll recognize you on the website. We'll send you a nifty certificate for your habitat. You can send us pictures um, of the plants that you have in your garden and the insects visitors within. You can also get a sign to proudly display your support of our Midwestern pollinators. To date, um, starting our second year, we've received over 190 garden registrations so far. Our goal is to get to 500 by the end of the year, and I'm getting garden registrations in every day, so I think we're gonna get there. I wanna quickly talk about our website. We wanted to make it a clearinghouse of information, everything that you needed to know about butterfly gardening, what um, kinds of butterflies you're seeing, how to identify the insects, information on our partners, information on bees. So even people who have no experience with gardening or um, no experience with insect conservation can be part of this project. The support that we've gotten so far has been overwhelming, both from gardeners and the community as a whole, and especially from our, um, our official partners. What it means to be an official partner is you have an on-site garden, you broadcast PGF information to your audience throughout the year, um, and you have uh, pollinator or prairie events throughout the year for education. And this has really um, increased our audience, and the success of Plant Grow Fly is built on a solid foundation of partnerships. We've got about 35 now. Um, we'll have our second annual Butterfly Festival on September 20th. We'll have meets and greets with local pollinating experts. Hopefully, the American Honey Queen will be there again. Last year, we had a demonstration beehive. We had an insect parade where kids could dress up as their favorite insect. And um, of course, many of you will realize that in September, late September, we'll be in the midst of the southern migration of the monarch butterfly. So hopefully, we'll see many monarchs on zoo grounds. We're also beginning to collaborate with other Midwestern zoos. Blank Park Zoo is a small zoo, but we have almost half a million people in our audience. If you think of other Midwestern zoos, we have some of the biggest zoos in the nation. Think Kansas City, St. Louis, Omaha, Brookfield. We have um, wrapped up this project, even taken Blank Park Zoo off the logo, information on all the lessons we learned, templates and information of everything on the website, and exported it to 40 other Midwestern zoos. 10 of the 40 have said that they are interested in implementing Plant Grow Fly at their zoo. Some are going to implement it fully. Others are going to take parts of the program that fit their organization best. Um, one of my favorite examples is Detroit Zoo is going to take some at-risk at -risk teens to a nature lodge for a week, restore habitat around the nature lodge, and send them home with a pot with one host plant and one nectar plant. Um, and I think that I forgot to mention 
by, by saying no effort too small, at the very least, an official plant grow fly garden needs to have one host plant and one nectar plant off that list. And that's to make sure that we include all demographics. And even if you live in a retirement home and you just have a balcony or you have a tiny little patch of grass in the parking lot, you can be part of this project. We also want to reach out to local municipalities, corporate landscapes. I'm happy to report that all 20 of the Des Moines area high V stores are installing plant grow fly gardens in their storefronts and will be selling butterfly plants in their greenhouses. The possibilities are endless. We truly believe that on a local level, solutions to pollinator decline are simple and straightforward, and there's something concrete that each of us can do by simply putting plants in the ground. Backyard gardens can lead to other backyard gardens, can lead to Blank Park Zoo's garden, and it can provide a wildlife corridor that our insects so desperately need. So we hope that you'll join us on this journey. Help us plant, grow, and fly. Thank you. I think I have uh, time for one or two questions before we move on. And we'll also have time at the end. Anybody have a garden that they can register? And you don't have to do a new garden. You can simply add some of these pollinator plants to an existing garden as well. Um, so I hope I'll see a few registrations come from this talk. As we get the next PowerPoint um, started, I would like to introduce you to Andrew Joseph, the state apiarist. He has an MS degree in entomology at the University of Kentucky in Lexington and has been with the state since 2008. Please welcome Andrew. All right. Well, hello. Thanks for having me out. I'm here to represent the Department of Agriculture here in Iowa uh, today. And also I'd like to throw in the Iowa Honey Producers Association as well. Um, that's a group that I'm really appreciative of. It's a, about a thousand member um, association of beekeepers from first year backyard hobbyist, a hive or two, all the way up uh, into our biggest uh, commercial beekeepers with thousands upon thousands of colonies. So it's a great group. And I'll mention them a couple times throughout the slideshow. Um, this picture right here reminds me to tell you that I stole almost every uh, picture in this whole slideshow, <laughs> either from uh, beekeepers, which I guess with their permission wouldn't be uh, theft, or just flat out off the internet. So uh, don't give me credit for any of the images in the slideshow. These hives here are, uh, belong to Phil Ebert, who's a commercial beekeeper over in Linville, Iowa. Um, I use a few of his pictures throughout this, and of course I think it's timely because it's commercial hives of bees pollinating apples, which is going on, of course, right now. So I'll start off with a very basic question. Um, what can be expected from bees and beekeeping? I'm narrowing down the topics here from pollinators as a whole, of course, all the way down to honeybees, one specific species of bee um, that's kept in managed colonies by beekeepers. And the experience is almost whatever you're chasing on a personal level. It's everything from the hippie over here with the beard of bees. That's not me, I should say that. Um, started out uh, in the bees probably with a very similar mind frame. You know, a couple hives of bees, hillside, Kentucky at that time actually carved into the side of a hill because there was no flat land for them. Um, to have fun, make a little honey, make some mead, which is a fermented honey uh, beverage. Uh, share some honey with family, that sort of thing, and just kind of enjoy them. I got fascinated by them, and, which is a commonly shared experience across beekeepers. And the hive numbers have grown. I personally keep about 100 colonies uh, right now, all in Polk County. And now, you know, after <laughs> yesterday afternoon and evening, I feel like this guy here, uh, sore lower back from bending over, probably working for pollination in this photo, chasing honey crops. You know, you have a serious economic interest in this. A lot's invested, but there's also some financial gain on the other end. It's not all fun and games, but yet the fascination never disappears. It just gets more intense, I think, over the years. Honeybees are kind of like that. Um, I, I don't know a beekeeper that would disagree with this in that the more you learn about them and the more experience you have, uh, it, it just raises more questions uh, in your mind and makes it all that much more interesting over the years. All right, we're seeing just an explosion. Uh, and you had mentioned the interest in uh, you know, smaller animals, these overlooked kind of pieces of our environment. We're seeing this across the country, maybe worldwide, but definitely countrywide. Uh, there's this interest in small scale and urban beekeeping, women getting into beekeeping, youth getting into beekeeping that's changed the dynamic from a bunch of uh, rural white dudes. Out in the country, bees, everybody else staying away. Now we've got backyard beekeepers almost no matter where you are. We're seeing ordinances overturned. 
Uh, and this is a national trend that's, of course, occurring here in Iowa as well. So if there's ordinances in the town prohibiting beekeeping, that may or may not be there here in a couple of years. The trend is that, you know, we're just filling up backyards with, with bees, and I think it's all for the best. And then, of course, we also have the other side of that. This picture uh, is over of uh, Spring Valley Honey, which is Kurt and Connie Bronnenberg over in Perry, and they keep maybe 4,500 or so hives uh, around in there. The emphasis becomes more and more on pollination rather than fun or honey production, that sort of thing. Of course, honey is an important part of their business, but they're moving colonies around, they're pollinating almonds. Um, you know, that pollination paycheck at the end of the year becomes a very important thing that's sustaining our bee industry. In our commercial guys, which we have maybe somewhere between 15 and 20 beekeepers in Iowa that I would consider commercial bees, that's over five, 600 colonies on up into the thousands, well into the thousands. Most of those guys are going out to California for almond pollination, maybe down to Texas, maybe even doing some cranberry pollination throughout the summer. Their bees are moving. That's why you see bees on pallets in this picture. So, and of course our bee industry here in Iowa is everything in between two hives in the backyard to, to 10,000 colonies. We think we have got about 4,500 or so beekeepers across the state. This number is growing. Last year I would have said 4,000, and I think actually I might be underestimating this number. Uh, if you say that uh, maybe an average of about 10 hives apiece gives you about 45,000 hives, that lines up pretty good with some USDA national uh, statistics on this. And in reality, the average isn't, the average beekeeper does not have 10 hives. The average beekeeper has just a small handful of hives, two, three, four, but then you're outweighed by that very small minority of beekeepers with all those big hives, and that's how you get that number. Now, if you multiply that by our Iowa average of about 60 pounds of honey per colony per year, which is the amount that we can take off the colonies, providing them with what they need, and now use that honey for our purposes, if that's about 60 pounds per colony and you run that through a little multiplier, you end up around 2.5, 2.7 million pounds of honey produced in Iowa per year, which is pretty substantial. Our crop pollination value is 150 to 180 million dollars per year. And this is all that variety of, of you know, uh, fruits and vegetables that we have, everything from apples on through melons and all sorts of other things as well. And it's also given a little tip to maybe what we're seeing is a very, very slight boost in soybean production as well. And that's, there's some current research that's being done at Iowa State to really tease that out. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing that's going on right now is how much our honeybees, beekeeper managed honeybee colonies contributing to soybean yields, which is of course enormous interest here in Iowa. All right. So having talked over some of the beekeeper uh, oriented points, I'd like to at least mention pieces of a honeybee colony here, um, take you into the biology that I think is so fascinating. Uh, we've got queen bee. This is the long bee in the middle here. It's this bee. You can actually see she's actually laying an egg in this picture. She's searching for a place to lay that egg. She's surrounded by worker bees. All the smaller bees in this photo um, are her daughters. They're all female. And then there is a third bee in the hive called a drone. That's your male bee. And I'll show you some better pictures of these uh, as well. They all work together. Without any one of these three um, types of bees, casts of bees in the hive, the whole thing's going to collapse. Um, you got to have the worker bees. Their, their name is pretty apt. Their bodies are a picture of, of what they do, you know, that form following function sort of thing. Their bodies are covered in branched hair. That's to collect pollen as they manipulate flowers. They comb that back to these big, dense hairs on their hind legs. That's how they're going to carry that pollen, that protein, back into the colonies. Internally, she has a crop inside of her, like a canteen, basically, for taking nectar from flowers, transporting that back into the colony to feed her sisters and mother and brothers. She's got antenna that's, she smells, basically, with those antenna. That's how she senses the world around her. Compound eyes to find these images in the landscape, these clusters of flowers that she can visit, again, for food collection uh, and sort of things. Everything about her body, from her wings on back to the stinger that, per, that she uses in defense of the colony in their food stores, is basically there to, uh, to allow her to do her best to fuel this colony as a whole, this group of 40, 50,000 of her family members there to feed and protect them and care for them uh, throughout her five-week lifespan and keep that thing running throughout the year. This is the queen. Same sort of anatomical sort of observations you can make. She's all ovaries. This whole hind end on this queen is potential eggs. Uh, and that's her job. Her eyes are undersized. Her, her wings are undersized for her body. Everything about her basically is designed to be in that hive, 
laying eggs and being cared for by her daughter. She's not even necessarily feeding herself or keeping herself clean. She's relying on her offspring to do that for her. She's basically there as royalty. There's your royalty. <laughs> Bell's our royalty. She's there basically as an egg-laying slave just to keep this machine rolling along. And then here's the drone. I, I empathize with drones quite a bit. Uh, Barrel-chested kind of dudes, dumb as rocks. They're out for... <laughs> They're out for reproduction purposes only. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't take it to that extent here. But their eyes just mask their entire head like an old school football helmet, like a leatherhead football helmet. That's how they're sensing their environment. They have these huge antennae hanging down off their faces. I mentioned before with the worker bee that that's how they're smelling and sensing the world. This drone's antenna is actually touching the surface that he's resting on. He can sense a queen at just an enormous distance by smell, follow that plume towards her, see her at a great distance with those big eyes, beat any other drones that are out there in the environment with those huge flight muscles that he has and these big wings there. And if he's successful at this, great, he gets to mate with a queen and then he's gonna die uh, immediately afterwards, fall to the ground and, and that's the end of him. And if he's not so successful, eventually fall's coming. And here in Iowa around Halloween time, the worker bees, his sisters, uh, are going to kick him out of the hive. If he wasn't successful at this one purpose in life, to reproduce there, to pass the genetic line on to a future queen, they're going to kick him out of that hive because he's going to eat a lot, can't sting to defend it, never gathered anything up. It's just not in their nature to have too many drones go through a winter time. So his end is coming, <laughs> whether, he, uh, um, whether it's worth the colony's while or not. And this is a picture basically of them. Uh, all interacting inside the hive. No drones in this picture either, unfortunately. It would be a relatively perfect photo if it, if it had a drone in it. But we see the queen marked with a yellow dot, uh, just to make her stand out a little better in there. You know, going around, this would normally be in the darkness of a colony, laying eggs. The eggs are hatching. We see different stages of larvae across this photo as they grow. They reach this capped stage for pupation, much like the monarch pictures that we saw, the egg, caterpillar, in this case, that's your larva. Instead of eating leaves like a monarch would, the worker bees, its older sisters, are going to bring it the food uh, to make it grow. It reaches a stage. Instead of forming a cocoon hanging from a leaf or something, it goes on inside the, the darkness of the hive underneath that wax capping. Chews her way out, and she gets down to business and keeps that cycle going and going. We also see some honey up towards the top, and we see some pollen. These little pasty cells there are their protein requirements. So. Kind of a nice picture, I think, just the life of a colony. Oops. And again, just with the highly specialized body structure. Really, I just threw in this picture to, uh, to advertise weeds, the importance of weeds here. These dandelions, of course, in bloom right now are just essential, I think, for our part of the world right now. Uh, the more dandelions, the better from a honeybee's perspective because it provides an early season nectar and pollen source, both proteins and carbohydrates, to stimulate this colony and get it built up before the rest of the season comes in. We're probably going to talk over ourselves a little bit from your talk to my talk to Bell's talk here. But again, with the, about the three quarters of the plants out there in the na natural world relying on some sort of insect uh, for a pollinator, a wild pollinator, uh, to produce fruits, to, to set seeds, really gets at the importance not just of honeybees but of insects around. These pictures I got from a TED talk from Marla Spivak, and I'm not even sure if they were original to her, but uh, I like to use these and go kind of back and forth because it's just one more way to illustrate that importance of honeybees and other pollinators in terms of not just the world around us, but the actual foods that we eat at the grocery store. So this picture is of the store with honeybees, and this picture is what our selections would be without. Of course, this is the produce section, and what we see are basically a few things, some leafy greens and some seedless fruits. That's about it. So the color of our diets, the diversity, the flavors, things like this for us, a lot of nutrition is absent without bees. All right. More on apple pollination here because it's going on right now. As the season goes on, though, we'll move from some of these early uh, pollination uh, jaunts that beekeepers can do on through honey production, which is the focus of many of our smaller scale beekeepers. We're not so much after a pollination paycheck. We're after a honey crop. We want it for ourselves, for our families to give away or maybe to make a few dollars uh, from at the end of the year. And this picture, I think, is just a nice uh, photo of bees taking the nectar from plants, storing it that they've collected, storing it in the honeycombs that they've drawn, the architecture of their hive, and then dehydrating that honey down 
from this dilute nectar that they've collected from plants, a sugary sort of floral water, concentrating that, drying it down, adding some enzymes, and curing it into the finished product of honey. In, in the top corner of this, over towards, uh, I don't know, Sioux City, <laughs> um, we see the capped product. Once the, it's reached a certain moisture content, it's nice and dry, it's cured, it's actually honey, it's not nectar anymore, the bees cover that over with white wax. And that's how it's done. They basically sealed that mason jar, and now it's a food product for them with a long shelf life um, so that they'll have something to eat in their colonies when there are no blooms out, you know, from fall till spring, early spring. Now, as beekeepers, as long as we leave enough of that for the colonies, we can take off the surplus. So we like to keep big, productive colonies that make way more food than what they need. And when that's the case, this is what we see in our hive. And so the summertime game for a beekeeper is basically just a super up would be the jargon, meaning add boxes on top and you know, let the bees fill them up, stay one step ahead of the, of the space requirements of the hive. So we'll have all of these frames, like the picture on the right uh, shows, of these nice full, weighing a few pounds a piece, honeycombs, covered over with those white cappings so we know it's actually honey and not nectar or anything in between. We can remove those from the colonies Average Iowa beekeeper does this in September. We bring them back to our honey house, get them away from the bees that want it back <laughs> into you know, a nicer environment to do the extraction. We cut the wax cappings off, either by machines or just with knives. Many of us use a heated knife just to kind of cut, kind of melt the wax capping off to reveal the, the cells of honey inside there. We put them into these extractor drums, which come in all different sizes to suit different scales of beekeepers, and they spin. It's like a centrifuge, so kind of like a washing machine would throw the water out of your clothes by spinning around. In a honey extractor, it's doing exactly the same thing. You load it up with all these opened uh, honeycombs, you turn it on, it spins, the honey's thrown out, runs down the walls of the stainless steel extractors, down into buckets where it can be filtered or, or bottled. And that's what this picture illustrates. I think it's, uh, it's a sad fact, but it's a true fact, that honey is becoming unique uh, in food products at stores in that it is uh, unmessed around with. Um, if you took the honey in this jar here, one pound or so jar, 12 ounces, 16 ounce jar, that we'd sell as a pound of Iowa honey at a farmer's market or in a grocery store, and you gave it back to the bees, it is exactly identical to what they first had in those cells. There aren't very many food products that we have that are, that are like that. And in terms of you know, uniqueness, it's the only food product that insects make for themselves that we take and we eat for ourselves, that there's nothing else um, similar at all. So it is very special honey. I, I like to brag up Iowa honey as being a nice light floral honey. It's a unique product. The type of honey, the color, the flavors uh, are all dependent on the plants that the bees forage from. So this prairie history of Iowa and the diversity of plants that we have is directly related to the final product there. It's unique and I think it's a very special product. If I haven't turned you off on this, this last slide here is just some options for education. We've got the Iowa Honey Producers Association. This is their website, abuzzaboutbees.com. They have a monthly newsletter that you can see online, whether you're a member or not. If you're a paid member, you'll get it in the mail as well. Otherwise, you've got to look at a PDF on the website. We do a summer field day. It's in mid-July this year. You'll see information about all this stuff on the website. We also do an annual meeting in November. We have speakers from all over the country come every year, and it's just always a really great event. It's over a weekend, a Friday and a Saturday. And we have nearly 1,000 members now. We've, uh, it's back to the, the increase in attention that the bees are getting um, and the bee industry is experiencing. We've gone from about 500 or so members just a few years ago on up to 1,000 members, and we are over 100 years old as our group. So anybody that's even halfway interested in bees should check out this website <laughs> or give me a call, of course, and I'll show you that information as well. In one way or another, uh, we can get you involved and get started off right. There's classes offered through the honey producers, all sorts of different ideas and options out there for educating yourself. So I'll leave it at that. I have no idea where I'm at on time. If there's a few minutes left for questions. Oh, good. Great. Sometimes I'll talk right over myself. I'll take any questions you got. I don't think it's that great of an idea, and I'll tell you why. Uh, for me, beekeeping develops, being a good beekeeper develops out of a fascination with the bees. In this flow hive, uh, we're talking about it, but I'm gonna just assume that if anybody else in this room has Facebook, you've seen the flow hive, it's been everywhere recently. And it's this idea that, marketed as such, where you can just have a beehive, 
no muss, no fuss, no skill, you know, sort of thing involved. You just throw the bees out there and they're gonna make you honey. And it's this plastic compartment on top of a beehive. You can come and tap it just like a beer keg at the end of the season and all the honey's gonna drain out. I can't say if it works or not. I've never seen one with my own eyes. But I know that beekeeping is a lot more than that. And I think what this product is doing is it's kind of taking away one of the more, uh, I, I don't wanna sound sappy here, but one of the more special experiences of beekeeping. Uh, it is a joy to extract honey. It, it is a, a really fascinating process to remove the honey from the hive. Uh, it is uh, incredibly fun on a small scale to take your few supers of honey that you got off the two hives that you've watched and cared for and worried about for an entire season and then extract that out in, in your own home. And this, this invention, this flow hive, just seems to take away all of that. I'm a little skeptical as to how it works, but even aside from that, it just doesn't suit my aesthetics, I guess. We don't need more plastic garbage in beehives. Yeah. Gosh, I think that's a great question. I hope it's not coming. <laughs> if you notice a lot of the photos that I showed you, including this one right here, <laughs> uh, of these are queen cells, future queens developing in a cup to start new hives with. It, these photos, I think, might illustrate the cooperation and participation that we have of some of our biggest beekeepers in the state with our Honey Producers Association, with small-scale beekeepers. I certainly don't see that. And maybe a honey uh, or beekeeping is unique in that. I don't know. Um, I, I don't see a, a real competition-oriented uh, sort of community. What I, what I see instead are people working with each other. I, I glossed over a lot of the hardships of bees. I didn't talk about Varroa mites as damaging things. I didn't talk about pesticide impacts, lack of diversity in the environment, you know, different bee diseases that get shared everywhere, the hardships of moving bees around. I talked about the good stuff <laughs> today. Uh, I, I don't think I would ever consider adding commercial beekeepers to the list of nasty things for the bee industry. I definitely do not see that. I see our commercial industry here in the state as being entirely cooperative with you know, my regulatory program, me coming out there needing certain permits to move across state lines. But beyond that, beyond my relationship with them, I see a lot of them as mentoring beekeepers in their areas, doing talks at nature centers, things like this. I don't see that, that competition idea like this is my territory, there's no room for hobbies. Um, I don't know if that will change in the future, but it certainly isn't happening now, yeah. Our commercial industry I consider to be a great boon and boost for small scale beekeepers trying to start up, yeah. So I hope that that would be agreed. How many, are there beekeepers in this room other than Bell and I? No? Just us. Do you agree with what I said there? <laughs> I definitely know that my boss has 2,000 hives, and he is constantly having hobbyists come in, and he'll give them equipment, and they'll come just to ask questions all the time, and he just loves having more beekeepers. And I know a lot of commercial beekeepers who have up to five people they're mentoring and helping them get through the season. I really don't think there's competition. That sure is mine. And that's, it's a great question to ask because it is kind of a unique thing. Now, here's honey as well. Um, the American demand for honey is growing, which is wonderful. Bees are having a hard time, uh, which means they're dying over winter. When I say a hard time, it doesn't mean they're like wiped out tired at the end of the day. It means they're dead. <laughs> um, so maybe I need to, to choose better, more accurate words. But what I, what I actually uh, see is this idea that we're not competing against each other and the more awareness that there is out there of pollinators and pollinator interests, the better. Uh, it's increased uh, awareness of bees, so people are being more careful with pesticides, potentially, in their own homes, whether or not they're a beekeeper. And it's an increase in, oh, I know this guy, I'm gonna buy some honey you know, at the farmer's market, so it helps everybody. It's not his or mine, it's each of us together equals more. So I, I think that's the way it is, probably anywhere you are. Yeah, that's another great question. There sure are. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of different native bees. And again, I'm a honeybee guy. <laughs> um, I, I did a lot of my grad work on, uh, on bumblebees. So it's not that I don't know anything about native bees, but on a day-to-day -day basis, bee to me means honeybee. That's not true for everyone out there. We've got all sorts of a diversity of pollinators. And uh, we see also a, a, an increasing interest in providing habitat, homes, little bee hotels, things like this, and forage not just for honeybees, for, for all sorts of native bees, whether it's solitary, stingless bees, orchard bees, mason bees, diversity of bumblebees, all the way up. So um, 
in terms of competition, the second part of your question, there have been a couple papers, absolutely, that if you introduce large numbers of managed colonies of honeybees into, say, prairie restoration sites, you can get floral competition, I mean food resources are being fought over between all of these, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of honeybees coming from this, you know, large number of colonies that you place there and smaller populations of uh, native bees. So yes, it absolutely can happen. Now in terms of whether or not it happens real life, uh, I don't know. I, I honestly, I have no idea. I, I tend to doubt that it happens as much as what it could. Um, I don't think that there's that much competition out there right now, despite the increase in bees <laughs> and beekeepers, yeah. One more, One more and then I'll get off the road. Yeah, anybody else? Sure, uh, they go as far as they need to, I think would be the most accurate answer doesn't tell you anything, so I'll add some numbers to that and maybe they're right, maybe they're not. I think almost everything is done within a mile. If you drew a, a, you know, a compass uh, circle around that pinpoint of where that beehive is in the landscape, you're not gonna see many of those bees going beyond that one mile. Now, a number that gets thrown around a lot is three miles. Um, and I think if you're in sort of a, an area that's really lacking in diversity, you have a strong colony of bees, plenty of food reserves already stored in there so they actually have the fuel to get their bodies going to feed the flight because it takes energy to fly, they can go as far as maybe three miles away from the colony and make it back round trip and still gain maybe a little something for their efforts. Because that's the economics of this, right? You gotta find your flower patch and collect more nectar that equals basically more calories than what you exerted to get out there and back. So three miles probably is about that line. That's what gets thrown around a lot. That said, beekeepers, uh, researchers have taken bees from hives and then say driven five miles away, marked those bees and released them, and then had a person back at the colony to see, hey, did any of those pink colored bees ever show up? And yeah, they can fly for five, six miles. Um, I don't think they're actually doing that you know, on their own out there, but they can fly incredible distances if they need to. Yeah. All right, and with that, I'll get out of the way. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Belle. Uh, you asked me to introduce her and I almost totally forgot. Um, I should say Gabrielle, Queen Gabrielle, being a little too informal. I've got her bio in front of me, so I might as well read it here. She's a 19-year-old student at Iowa State University, majoring in marketing. She became interested in beekeeping at a young age and has been employed by Fastbinder Apiary since 2008. Bob Fastbinder is, if I can say this, one of the absolute best beekeepers in the state and just a great all-around guy. So she's off to a good start all the way back from the beginning. Uh, assisting in managing 2,000 beehives. As the 2015 American Honey Queen, Gabrielle serves as national spokesperson on behalf of the American Beekeeping Federation, which is a trade organization representing beekeepers and honey producers throughout the United States. She's just doing an excellent job. We like to brag that she was our Iowa Honey Queen before she was the national one, and she's just wonderful. Thank as you. See. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andy. Like he said, I'm the 2015 American Honey Queen, Gabrielle Hemsoth. My job is to travel the country and teach people about honey and honeybees. And I'm the second ever American Honey Queen from Iowa. So I'm having a really good time hitting a lot of places in Iowa while I study for finals. <laughs> These are some pictures up here just to show you that honeybees are really friendly. I'm going to touch on a lot of the same things as Andy said, but I'll try to get into areas that he didn't cover as much and focus on those. First time, I'm going to get a little bit on the three types of bees, but try to get some information that's a little different. The worker bee does do all the work in the hive. Usually the females of the room appreciate this. And just like a kid learns how to ride a tricycle before they can learn how to ride a bike and learn how to drive a car, the worker bees do go through different phases that they learn how to do these jobs. So when they're first born, they start out by cleaning the hive. As they get older, they can learn how to be a nurse bee and take care of the other bees, be a wax builder, be a guard who actually protects the hive. And then the last job they do is a forager, which means they leave the hive and collect nectar. That is the most difficult and the most dangerous job. Worker bees do work themselves to death within about five to six weeks. And a big part of that is being a forager. As they fly out and collect nectar, they're encountering different animals that could cause them issues. They're flying through grass and ripping up their wings. So really, they put their whole life into gathering nectar, and that ends as a forager. 
The drone's only job is to mate with the queen, and like he said, they're disposed in the winter. This is just a picture, so you can see that the drones do mate in flight with the queen. She can mate with about 12 to 15 drones at one time during one mating flight, and she will hold the sperm from all those drones in her body for the rest of her life, so she never has to mate again. And this is the queen in the center of her nurse bees called her court. The queen has two jobs. Her first is to lay eggs, and a lot of people say the number is about 2,000 a day at the height of summer, but that might be a lower number when the colony's building up or when they're not doing as well. Her second job is to spread pheromones throughout the hive. You can think of it as a perfume. They're chemical scents, and they let all the other bees know that the hive is okay and the queen is okay. Now these bees around her, her nurse bees, will feed her and take care of her. They also rub up against her body to get her pheromones on their own bodies and then spread them throughout the hive so everyone can always smell the queen. If the queen goes missing or is suddenly killed, all the worker bees will know very quickly, within an hour, and they'll become agitated and they'll decide they need to make a new queen. So her spreading pheromones throughout the hive is a very important job. I'm going to touch on exactly how honeybees pollinate and what the importance of that is. And pollination is when pollen from the stamen of the flower is transferred to the stigma of the flower. And this here is a honeybee just covered in pollen. Pollin honeybee pollination accounts for about 80% of the one-third of food that is pollinated by insects. So a huge part of our pollinators. And that's worth about $15 billion dollars in the United States each year. So here's a list of foods that are pollinated by honeybees. We already talked about how the beef industry can be affected by honeybees, but I like to take it a little bit further. Does anyone like ice cream? I'm a fan of ice cream. If you take that honeybees pollinate the alfalfa and the cows eat alfalfa and dairy cows make milk and that's how we get ice cream. So I thank honeybees every time I have a bowl of ice cream, which is, you know, five to six times a day. So feeds me. One crop that is very dependent on honeybees is the almonds. And we don't have almonds in Iowa. We are focused more on the apple and strawberry part of it. But I like to talk about this just because we are all one country and we need to care about what our other states are doing. The almond industry in California is worth about $11 billion every year and it produces about 104,000 jobs. These are people that are either working in the almonds or are packaging the almonds, marketing the almonds, and almonds are almost completely dependent upon honeybee pollination. So if the almond producers can't get these beekeepers to truck their bees out to California, the almonds cannot grow, they won't produce any fruit, and we wouldn't have that industry, and California would take a huge hit. We really need these migratory beekeepers to be able to keep our country working the way it does. Migratory beekeepers do hit a lot of different states a year in some cases. They may pollinate in California and also Florida. We don't have enough bees in the country to do all the work we need to, so we have to keep moving them. Honeybees are great pollinators. Part of that is their pollen basket. So this area back here is dense hairs. This honeybee is fully loaded with pollen. She has a big old ball. What makes them great pollinators is, first of all, their anatomy. So they're covered in these little branch tears. And when they land on a flower, pollen just gets stuck all over their furs. And it would personally really bother me, but the honeybees seem to enjoy it. They also have those pollen baskets. So the first part of what makes them great is just the way they're built. The second is their overwintering. A lot of insects lie dormant during the winter, but honeybees are a perennial hive. They stay awake and alert in their hive. They cluster around the queen, and they flex and unflex their flight muscles to produce heat. And they get this energy from eating honey to produce this heat, which is why we need to make sure we leave them enough to make it through the winter. They start laying eggs in early spring, again with the dandelions. They can go and collect nectar and pollen in the early springs, take it back to the hive, use that as fuel to raise their young. They'll have about 10,000 bees or more ready to start collecting as soon as the first flowers bloom. That's not the same with insects that lie dormant because they have to build up their populations. Now during the height of summer, they have about 40 to 60,000 bees per hive, so their populations just explode. 
And the, another reason why they're very good pollinators is because they're flower consistent. They'll start on one type of flower and keep going back to that same flower the whole day. Part of that is their scout bees. In the morning, they'll send out a few bees to look for a source of food, like a big grove of apple trees. When those scouts find those food, they come back to the hive and use a dance to tell all the other bees where they want them to go. You can't pollinate an apple tree with pollen from strawberries. So it's very important that the honeybees keep visiting the same type of flower all day because it helps all of our plants grow. It's also what creates different types of honey. Do you know that there is about 300 different varieties of honey in the United States alone? And each variety has a different kind of flat or a different taste. There's honeys that are a clear, liquidy water color all the way to a dark brown molasses, and they have vastly different flavors. And that's because the honeybees visit these different types of flowers and the nectar have different tastes. Because they're flower consistent and will visit the same type of flower, it makes it possible to gather these different types of honey and package them separately, which I think is neat. This is a little bit on the dances that they use to communicate. The first is the waggle dance, and this is the dance that the scouts use to tell the other bees where to go looking for this nectar. And how it works is first they walk forward the distance of how far away the source of food is. How far they walk forward is how far away the food is. So if it's right outside the hive, they might only take a step or two forward, but if it's a mile away, they're gonna walk a greater distance. The direction they walk is the direction corresponding to the sun that the bees need to fly. So as the sun crosses the sky, a dance for the exact same location will have a little bit of a different direction. And how fast they shake while they do this dance is how good of a food source it is. Honeybees essentially have a dance off in the hive throughout the day, just trying to tell all the other bees where they should collect their food. I do have a video. Just, it's a lot easier to understand if you get to see the bees doing the dance. So they're shaking to, that's how good of a food source it is. And they're walking a pretty good distance forward, so it's not gonna be right outside the hive. And she just circles around to get back to her starting place. And these bees around her are kind of bumping into her and gathering information. They're trying to see exactly where she's going. And once they have a good idea of where exactly they're supposed to fly, they'll take off and gather nectar and then come back to the hive and possibly do the dance themselves to show the rest of the foragers that it was a really good food source and they should go out and collect from that food source. The shaking signal isn't exactly a dance, but I think it's worth mentioning. The honeybees do sleep or kind of rest at night or do, during rainy weather, which is something that a lot of people don't know. And when these scouts come back and want other foragers to go looking for food, they can get a little frustrated if nobody's listening because they're trying to do this dance, but all the bees are sleeping. So they'll grab on to the honeybees that are sleeping or resting and shake them, telling them to wake up and get to work. Your mom isn't the only one who does it. They shake each other and tell them that they need to fly and collect nectar. I'm gonna to touch on exactly how honeybees make the honey. Does anyone like honey in this room? I love honey. And how it works is first they have to collect the nectar. So the older bees fly to the flower and fill up their honey stomach with nectar. What you need to know is that a honey stomach is nothing like your stomach. It's just a special area in their body to store nectar. They have a completely different stomach to digest their food. They collect this nectar and then they fly back to the hive and share the nectar with their younger sister through their hollow tongue called a proboscis. The younger sister takes the nectar into her honey stomach and she'll mix it with enzymes and then put the honey in those small combs beneath their feet. At this point, the honey's very liquidy. It's not like the thick honey you see in stores. So the bees have to fan their wings quickly to evaporate the extra water and bring down the moisture level. After that, they'll cover it with wax to seal it in. Once honey's been made, it never goes old. Researchers found sealed vats of honey in King Tut's tomb that were still edible despite thousands of years beneath the sands. Does anyone, raise your hand if you've had some honey that kind of gets white or crystally, you think it's gone bad possibly. It's not old. All you have to do is put your jar of honey in some warm water and it'll turn right back into liquid honey. Honey is used for a lot of different things. I have brochures out on the table 
that have lots of different recipes you can try out with honey. Honey is great for baking because it keeps your goods moist. You can make breads and cookies and they'll just stay better for longer. It's also great for small cuts and wounds. It's because honey is antibacterial. So if you put some honey on a scrape and a Band-Aid over, it'll keep it from getting infected. It also keeps your skin soft and aids in the healing. You can also use honey in your cosmetics. Rumor has it that Cleopatra bathed in milk and honey to keep her skin young and glowing. I personally use honey as a face wash. I really like it. I will touch on a little bit of the problems facing honeybees. I'm not going to keep it all on the good. Part of it is habitat loss. We do have a tendency to cut the flowers in our ditch. People like to spray dandelions out of their yard and keep everything very managed. But honeybees need these different floral sources. Just like we have to have meat and grains and fruit and vegetables, honeybees need nectar from all these different types of flowers, dandelions to apples, things that we consider weeds are treasure chests for honeybees. So part of it is the habitat loss. Then pesticides that are used irresponsibly or where we really don't need them can sometimes harm the honeybees. And pests are a huge part of it. This is a varroa mite. It's kind of disgusting looking. It's the biggest issue facing honeybees right now, it will suck what would be like the blood out of honeybees while they're developing. They're still young bees in the cell. And a huge part of it is it transmits diseases. Just like a mosquito can transmit diseases, a varroa mite can do so to honeybees while it's feeding off of it. And they can kind of explode in population. So if beekeepers aren't taking care of their honeybees and managing these issues, they can become an, a problem. That's why it's so important for beginner beekeepers to take classes and read books and get a beekeeper mentor so they're aware of problems and can help manage them instead of being oblivious. Ignorance is bliss, but your bees might die and then you won't be happy. Weather can be another concern. I talked about how honeybees don't hibernate during the winter. They do stay alive or stay awake and eat honey and flex their muscles for fuel. So a lot of the times they don't actually die of the cold. What might happen is they'll run out of food in the hive and they can't make energy to produce heat and then they could die. Just another thing you need to be aware of with honeybees, the different issues that face them. Which is why we have beekeepers. A beekeeper's job is to take care of the honeybees, make sure that they're safe and well cared for. Part of how we do that is where we place them in our bee yards. I do help manage 2,000 hives, and I have two hives of my own. Uh, my boss is a honey producer, so these are some of the different things that beekeepers can do as a business. Honey producers are more focused on the honey crop. They might not move their bees to pollinate plants. They're going to put them somewhere that they can produce a lot of honey, and that will be their main focus. You can also be a honey packer. These Beekeepers don't necessarily know anything about bees or keep bees. They can buy honey from a beekeeper, put it into smaller bottles, and put it into stores for sale. You can also do the pollination services, like taking the bees out to California, trucking them around the country, and these beekeepers might not care about their honey crop very much at all. Or queen and package rearing, mostly producing new bees to sell to different commercial beekeepers or hobbyists. Now some beekeepers will touch on all of these different industries and some will specialize in one or another. I do have time for questions now. As the American Honey Queen, I travel around the country and give presentations like this. So I last was in Oregon teaching new beekeepers how to install their packages, which is just a bundle of bees. And next I'll be going to Texas to talk to a lot of schools. I did on Monday, I was in Osceola, Iowa, doing four school presentations. I also do a lot of radio and TV interviews just to get the word about, out about honeybees and why we need them. Thank you so much. Thank you.